So we're talking about n equal to 2 supergravity. And half BPS black holes in n equal to supergravity, which carry charges QI and PI. These are dionic. And the idea is to focus on the near horizon region. Um, so that's actually a full BPS. Um, solution of the theory, and there's some ages two times n s two, uh, and today we're going to use. So this is Euclidean ads two. Uh, something I didn't mention was the symmetry generators. There's a symmetry u one symmetry generator which I'll call l naught. That's just the rotation of the disk. And another one here of, uh, called J naught, which is just the rotation of the circle uh, of the sphere. Okay, and in this geometry, um, we set ourselves the task to calculate the partition function of ADS two. Um, which is, we argued it's only a function of the charges, and it's given by a functional integral of something called a renormalized action of all the fluctuating fields of the gravitational field theory. And the fluctuating fields means to fix the boundary conditions according to the classical theory, namely according to the charges, fixed completely by the charges. And in the interior, you let everything fluctuate. And that's what you're integrating over. Okay, so that's our task. And this S renormalized uh, of the gravitational fields is um, so you so the input is some bulk Lagrangian or action. So yesterday, well, two days ago we wrote down, or maybe yesterday, the action of n equal to two supergravity, this S bulk of phi grav minus this the Wilson line with respect to all the electric fields in the theory. That's at r equal to infinity. And then there's a boundary term, which is also a local occasion variant function of all the fields. And you, that's chosen in such a way that this S renormalized is finite uh, and also supersymmetric. OK. So that's a recap. Um, any questions about this so far? either about the general formalism or philosophy or, or anything. Or what I'm going to do, if, if that helps you. Perfect. Everything is very clear. OK. So today, I want to do a calculation. So I really want to calculate this for, for this example. And the strategy is to use localization. Okay. So in order to use localization, the first condition is that you need some supersymmetry. And so that we're going to use this fact that this near horizon region is fully BPS. Um, so in fact, there are eight supercharges. And I only need one in order to do localization. So we saw the formalism of localization. Um, this was explained very nicely in more than one lecture. So we're going to take one. Uh, supercharge, which is uh, some kind of variation by a killing spinner epsilon on this geometry. Um, so there are eight of them. You can just so you suppose you write this geometry down. You can just ask what are the supersymmetries? There should be eight. You can just solve for the killing spinners, and there's one combination um, which squares this L naught minus G naught. Okay, and that's the one we're going to take. All right. Yes. So you're you're trying to localize supergravity, mm -hmm. but uh, there might be many many more other fields in there. If this is a twin theoretic, then then this is you're already deciding that many many other things are not complicated. 
No, no, I didn't decide anything of the sort. Um, so I said something which may have been a little cryptic, and today I'll repeat it more. Um, this action, so the question is what do we mean by phi graph? And what do we mean by the action? Okay. So phi gravitational, I repeat, uh, is, is a collection of all fields in the theory. Suppose you want to think of string theory, then it's, it's a graviton, deleton, Raman Raman field, uh, you know, and then higher spin, massless, uh, massive, massive fields, the whole tower of states, everything in the theory. Okay. Now, of course, this is an impossible task to actually write down, but what we can do very well is to write an effective action for the light modes by integrating out all the massive fields of string theory. This has been done since the beginning of string theory. So we can write some action, but now what is going to happen is that that action is no longer two derivative. It's going to be an infinite derivative action. That's what I mean by this. Okay, so I've not lost any information. So your Q should be a Q for the full thing. It, it is, so, what, so the way I'm going to do it is think of this functional integral. Good, I'm, I was going to talk about this later, but I can do it now. Um, so there are many new issues in localization when we apply it to supergravity, both technical and conceptual. So this is one of the issues. Okay. So the, the strategy is the following. Okay. There's no proof of this. Strategy is the following. So a priori your functional integral is not well defined. It's a gravitational functional integral. Okay. So there's an IR divergence which we cured, but there's a UV divergence of gravity which I've not cured. Okay. And I'm not. That's not my goal in this. In this, the idea is that. Because this observable is supersymmetric, we're just going to try to use the rules of localization, follow our noses, and just apply it and see what you get. And if you're really sort of a purist, you should take that as a definition of this class of functional integrals of quantum gravity. Just a second. Right. So, that's, so in practice, what I'm going to do is to write down an effective action for these fields. So the assumption is that I have a UV completion, which is consistent with supersymmetry with this supersymmetry. Okay. So that I'm going to assume. And then I write an effective action for these low energy fields, including all kinds of derivative terms. Okay. It's supersymmetric, so I can use this. And the idea is to not to integrate out all the fields until 0, because then you get these massless, yeah, these non-local things, which is the whole reason I started this, this problem. So I'm going to integrate it at some low but finite energies, and then use this effective uh, action to localize. And then you'll see that it, it, the answer looks good, and so then you can declare that this is the kind of thing to do. People do similar things in five-dimensional gauge theories. It's a very similar idea. Kirill. So when you insist on using localization and supersymmetry, yes. it means you're using the supersymmetric boundary conditions on the, on the surface. Correct. So it means you're computing on actually an index. No, you're not exactly computing the passing through. Correct. Okay. So maybe I should also, good. So there are all these points I was planning to do, but let me do it right now. So here, one was like, what is effective action? What is the action? What is the meaning of the action? S. Okay, so at least I gave some idea of that. The other is, what are we computing? So maybe I should take some time now and do it. Um, I'll do it here. Can I do it here? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Uh, so yesterday, one of the things we saw was that in this ADS2 times S2 geometry, if you look at a, a Maxwell field, there are two modes. And then the, the mode that dominates is the charge mode, charge carrying mode, and therefore the thing should be in the microcanonical also. That's why it's a function of only Q and P. Um, but now, let's put it together with another fact. So let's stick to four dimensional uh, N equal to two black holes, okay, an asymptotically flat space. So it's a fact that supersymmetric black holes in this context do not rotate in four dimensions. Okay? There are no solu supersymmetric solutions which rotate. Okay? Now, what that means is that, so rotation is some, is rotation is discharge J, J naught. Okay? So that's the J3 of the, so there's an SU2 rotation symmetry, and that's the J3 of it. Now, the fact that the supergravity solution doesn't um, carry J naught means that if you think of this as a, quantum ensemble, in the quantum theory, the expectation value of J naught is zero. Okay, that's just a fact you can find out by doing supergravity. Combine this with the fact that there is a microcanonical ensemble. It means that every state in the theory must have J naught equal to zero. Right? Because microcanonical means that the charge is fixed, and if the average charge is zero, that means every state is zero. Okay, so plus microcanonical 
J0 equal to 0 on all states, on each state. Okay. That means that whatever this ensemble is, this quantum ensemble is, let me use a Hamiltonian picture just to make, uh, it's just a shortcut. I can do it in the path integral language. But that means that e to the trace minus 1 over J0. J0, remember, was a rotation charge, so fermions are char have half integer charge with that. So it should be 2J0. So two, minus 1 to the 2J0 is just minus 1 to the F. Okay. That's just equal to trace of 1. Okay. So that's an index. Of the, that's a supersymmetric index. It's just minus 1 to the F. Okay. It's just F. And that's an entropy. Okay. So it means that whatever quantum gravity thing I'm doing here, what I'm calculating is, is both an entropy and an index. And this is the reason why a lot of the older work actually carries through to, to beyond the leading order. So what Bekenstein and Hawking want us to calculate is this. What Strominger and Waffa actually calculate in their microscopic things is this. Okay. So the idea is that you start from near horizon, you have entropy, you generalize this to quantum entropy, that's equal to that. Then you use this argument to say it's an index. And now you can, you can go to, to the uh, microscopic regime. So continue this, and that's protected. Okay, so that's that's one comment I want to make yesterday. So so thanks for bringing that up. So the slogan is uh, index equals entropy. Okay. Huh? Ah, degeneracy. Thank you. Exponential of the. Okay. If you want to know more details, there's. I mean, this is the philosophy, I and mean, this is the basic argument. There's a, one paper by Shoksen, I think 2012, something like this, and then another one by Sen, Davulkar, Gomsh, somewhere here, and myself, um, sort of flesh this out. Okay. okay, any other questions of this philosophical type? Okay, then let's move on. So I want to use localization. That's a supercharge. Um, so let me recall the strategy of localization. So recall. What is the strategy? Strategy, so I'm going to be brief because this was done already in Francesco's lectures. Um, so you start with some z, which you want to compute. So first you have uh, some q squared equal to h. Here, q squared equal to h. Uh, can I erase this? It's fine. I just want the whole board. So I have q squared equal to h. That's my starting point for, for this kind of localization. Q is some supercharge. H is some compact U1 generator. And what's the idea? I start with some functional integral of this type, d phi e to the minus s, where s uh, is supersymmetric. So Q of s is 0. S doesn't necessarily mean action. I'm just saying this is the action plus operators, everything, like here. Okay, it's the Wilson line plus operators. And so, okay. so the whole observable, I'm going to call e to the s. So it means actually the supersymmetric observable times e to the minus s. Okay. So what you do is you deform it. So you, what, Z, you deform to Z of lambda uh, by something called QV, where V, you choose. So you can have many choices. And I'm going to choose the one that Francesco explained. So just psi dagger Q psi. Okay. Then you argue that DZ D lambda, what that does is it brings down a QV e to the minus S of phi minus <coughs> lambda QV. And now you think of Q as some, uh, write it out in, in the field space. And it's some uh, differential operator on Q on, in field space. So you do some integration by parts. Okay. So this is QV of this whole thing. So that means it's Q of that, um, which is a total derivative, assuming there are no boundary terms in field space, minus um, Q times this. But Q of S is 0. Uh, and Q of uh, Q square of V is also 0. Okay, so this is 0 because Q of S is 0. And Q square, I've chosen V such that Q square of V is 0. And also I've used the fact that Q, the measure, is also invariant, is supersymmetric. Okay. So these are the conditions. And therefore, um, what I originally wanted was Z of 0, but that's equal to the limit lambda goes to infinity of Z of lambda. Um, and now uh, this thing localizes. So what does that mean? 
It means that as lambda goes to infinity, this term dominates. And so you just look at critical points of, I, I'm sure all of you have heard this 100 times, so let me repeat it on the first time. The critical points of this, um, the way we uh, rig this up, the critical points of, of this QV, this is a perfect square, so just Q psi equal to zero. So that just, become, that just becomes integral. I'm gonna call this the localization manifold, M lock. That's de defined as all, all fields such that Q psi equal to zero. So all solutions of that, okay? Then there's some induced measure. I'm gonna call these the fields. The coordinates on this manifold I'm gonna call phi lock for localization. Then what I have to do is to evaluate the action on an arbitrary point on this manifold. And then, um, again, because this is a perfect square at cube psi equal to zero, this itself is zero, so that doesn't contribute. But there's a one loop fluctuation determinant, which I have to, which is lambda independent, which appears in the, in the final answer. So it's one loop of QV. Okay, that's also a function of phi lock. Okay, so that's your basic localization formula, uh, which you already saw at least once, maybe twice, in the last few days. All right. So now um, I want to use this. I want to apply this to our problem. So what are the steps? The steps are the following. So steps. So the zeroth step. I forgot to say something. So in this argument, there was some confusion about this, so I want to say it out explicitly. In this argument, um, at least in the most naive way of doing it, it's crucial that this algebra holds off shell. Okay. And the reason is that in going from here to here, uh, sorry, in, in going from here to here to show that this is zero, I've used the algebra inside the function integral. I've used it for an arbitrary field configuration. Okay? So it's really crucial that, that I have it off shell. Mm -hmm. So step zero is that um, I need an off shell formulation of shell of n equal to two supergravity. I, I don't really need the full n equal to two supergravity. I just need this one q that I want, or q squared equal to. Just, let me just say one q. Okay, but that we already did. So Stefan explained very well how to do that. And I also reviewed that uh, yesterday. So that's step zero, and I mean, that's from the 80s. This is, we're using the super conformal formalism of DeWitt and Van Holten and Van Pruyen. Um, so these steps are outlined in this paper, 10, 12, 0, 2, 6, 5. Um, so the second step is you want to find this localization manifold. But the first step, so the, the zeroth step is a formal, formalism. First step is find the manifold. Then you have to evaluate <coughs> S on phi log at an arbitrary point. And finally, calculate Said one loop of QV. All right, and then put it together and do the integral, and that's your answer. Uh, my point is that each of these steps is different. It's, it's really qualitatively different from just rigid supersymmetric quantum field theory. Okay, so I want to give you a sense of what is different and how we go about it. So not everything is, is a theorem, unlike in, in, in quantum field theory. So one of the, uh, two of the points were already made, one of them that about the action, but I'll go through these things again. So I'll go through these things one, one by one, okay? Any questions so far? Yes, I'm assuming all kinds of things like that, which have been discussed already in the simple context of even free field theory or boring field theories. Um, there were um, there was a lot of discussion about it, so I'm not going to repeat that. So it's, there's some second-level discussion of that type, which. So there, it's not so much different because it's gravity, but because it's non-compact. That brings about a distance. Let's, let's postpone. That's a very technical thing, which 
it's postponed. So I don't think gravity brings about a new certainty in, for, uh, about that point. Okay. Um, very good. So let me actually remind you of what the off-shell formulation is. So I never wrote it down, and neither did Stefan, so let me do it. So you have, remember, a vial multiplet and a vector multiplet. So we need to write down the, the supersymmetry variations. So this is the gravitino, the two gravitini. And there's some parameter epsilon, like I showed. That's your killing spinner. This is some covariant derivative in gravity, in minus 1 8th gamma a gamma b, t a b i j, gamma mu epsilon j, minus gamma mu eta i. OK, remember all these fields. So this was the gravitino. This was this auxiliary, not auxiliary, this, yeah, auxiliary in some sense, T field, right, which was non zero in the vial multiplet. That's the thing that essentially became the gravity photon in the on shell theory, right? It's this anti symmetric, anti self dual tensor. Um, and eta was the parameter, so epsilon is the parameter of Q supersymmetry, and eta is the parameter of S supersymmetry, okay? So, and this is some covariant derivative, which I'll write in a second. And then there was, there were lots of gauge multiplets. Vector multiplets, and there's so there's two gamma mu t mu of x i times epsilon i plus half epsilon i j uh, f i mu nu minus minus gamma mu nu. Uh, I can't read my own handwriting. Uh, epsilon j. Uh, no, there's no minus here. It's just that times gamma mu nu epsilon j plus uh, y i j i epsilon j plus 2 x i eta j. Okay, so I just wanted to write it out once. Here it is. It's some very explicit supersymmetry transformation. It's slightly more complicated than the ones we've been seeing. Um, these, there are, these two, it's not about my handwriting. These two are actually different d's. Uh, they're both covariant derivatives, but the, the, it turns out that the gravitino variation has a slightly different um, derivative here than, than this. Okay, it's just a fact. I could have write, written it out. I just don't want to fill up the blackboard. Okay. It's just some, so this one starts something like, bo both of them start, slightly, but start like that, but this is um, d mu minus 1 fourth omega mu ab, gamma ab, the usual thing. That's the spin connection, and so on. And, and the so on contains all the fields that, under which um, psi mu is charged, uh, and similarly here. Okay, just something. So if you if you have questions about this, you can ask. But if it's just a question of what is this or that, I'll just refer you to the book. But but in an, maybe it's important to ask me if something is not clear. What do you refer to? Epsilon and eta. Ah, so epsilon. Is, so remember, there were Q supersymmetry and there was S supersymmetry in this formulation. Okay. Any other questions? Yes, yes, yes. So there are other things I'm not writing down, which. No, no, you have to write that down. It turns out that that is automatically satisfied for these things. But you have to, you have to, indeed, there's another spinner called chi. You have to write that down. All spinner variations should be zero. Other questions? Very good. OK, so now I'm going to do step one, which is to find all solutions to this, OK? So this is the kind of thing we saw a little bit in some quantum field theory uh, example. But now, the, the philosophy, even the philosophy is different, right? Because if you stare at this, let's stare at one of these equations. Let's say this one. So here's the question. What are the independent fields? Suppose I'm a computer. Which fields am I supposed to solve for? OK, this is supposed to be 0. So I, I put both of these to 0. Okay. Usually in quantum field theory, let's take this. This is some Gagino. You're given some background manifold, which comes with a killing spinner. Okay. And it comes with a metric. Okay. And then you're supposed to solve for these fields, all, all configurations of x and auxiliary fields. Right? Over here, the problem is much more complicated. I didn't tell you what, well, I sort of did, but I cheated. So here, now, so I said that the gravitational, um, Configuration, ADS2 times S2 configuration 
has eight supersymmetries, and I'm going to take one of them. But that's, in, that's when you really think of this ADS2 times S2 background. What I really want to do is a functional integral over the, all the supergravity fluctuations as well. Okay? And when I think of that, then it means that the metric is also fluctuating, and so is the gravitino. And because the supersymmetry you can think of it as generated by zero modes of gravitini, killing spinners can also fluctuate. The question is, what should I solve for? Okay? So this is a slightly, um, it's, a, it's a hard problem. It's a hard philosophical problem. Okay, one has to sort of find uh, rules. And I'll, I'll have a little bit more of formal discussion about this tomorrow. But let me tell you what the philosophy is. And if you think that that's not good enough, then let's have a discussion. Okay. So the philosophy is that because I'm doing a functional integral over gravity, I want to find all metrics. Okay, by metrics I mean all while multiplet configurations. Okay, so metric and, and T and all the all the fields in the while multiplet. Okay, that support some killing spinner. Silent. Okay, so that's what it means that it's supersymmetric. So I want to find all supersymmetric solutions such that as r goes to infinity, the you get back the attractor attractor classical background. It's background, so that's ADS two times S two, and epsilon goes to this epsilon naught that I uh, wrote down there. OK, so epsilon naught is some fixed killing spinner of ADS2 times S2. And what I'm giving myself to solve is to say I want to find all supersymmetric fluctuations of gravity, That's a, which means that it should support some killing spinner with the correct boundary conditions. Okay. So that sounds like a reasonable thing to do. And tomorrow I'll justify this even better. Um, but any discussion about this? Yes, Francesco. Yeah, so good. So, so here I'm going to choose. The, so today, I'll, I'll, I'll just assume that all fluctuations should be smooth. And at the, to, by the end of the lecture, I'm going to make. Yeah, all solutions, all the localization guys should be smooth. And at the end of, but at the, end of the lecture, I'm going to break it a little bit. You, you, please ask me if I forget to, ask, uh, to, to mention this. Do, do ask. <laughs> Uh, because I want to talk about this today. OK, so then, so that's the first step. And the second step is then, for each such geometry, or each such configuration, I'm just going to call it metric or geometry, but I really mean the full configuration, find uh, all solutions to the vector multiplet, vector multiplet solutions. Uh, with uh, configurations, configurations uh, with killing spinner, so with delta omega, delta epsilon, this epsilon equal to zero. Okay, so this is a problem we've seen already. But given some background, you just compute all possible. That background comes to the killing spinner. You just compute all possible supersymmetric fluctuations. But the first step is the more important one. Okay. Very good. So that's the philosophy. And as I said, um, I'll talk about this more tomorrow. But this was the thing that we followed in this paper. It sounds quite reasonable. So the next question is uh, one of practice. OK, so I said, this looks very nice. You have to find all possible solutions. But if you actually, if you ever tried such a problem um, that you have a gravitino variation, um, you don't know anything about the right hand side except boundary conditions. And I'm asking you to find all metrics and all killing spinners that, um, that this admits. It's a very uh, technically challenging problem. Okay? But uh, so practice how to find all solutions. Okay? But uh, thankfully, we've been helped by you know, technically very good people um, like, uh, like Witten. Um, <laughs> and then there was, uh, I think, Todd, 
And there were many people. I think Mitun was the first paper. Um, and then um, what I'm going to say now is, is in this paper uh, 1208. Uh, oh, God, this thing is being recorded. Um, but <laughs> 6221. OK, <laughs> I should watch my tongue. OK. Um, OK. Um, and what is the idea? So I'm going to do a simpler example just to tell you the idea because it's quite involved. Uh, uh, let me so let me take a simpler example. So just take delta psi mu i and just take the following covariant derivative. So um, two delta mu minus one quarter omega mu a b gamma a b minus quarter times gamma a b t a b i j um, gamma mu epsilon. OK, so I've switched off all the other fields. There are many other fields in the viral multiplet. I've only kept the metric, the spin connection, and this field t a b. That's necessary to solve for supersymmetric configurations. Yes? <coughs> I, 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 let me ignore all such things. Let me ignore all such things. So I just want supersymmetric solutions. So let, let's just take this after the class. Okay. So people who really know the superconformal uh, algebra, we can have a small five-minute discussion. I'll, I'll explain that. Okay. Uh, the answer is everything. I should keep both, of course. Okay. So what is the idea? See, the idea is. Uh, so this idea was go back to this. You form fermion bilinears. Okay. So. That's, oh, by the way, here there's another nice reference for the on-shell case. So, so all this was done in the on-shell case. And what was done in this paper was to use the same method for the off-shell case. Okay, so uh, there's probably the most recent and, and the paper I like the most is, is Gauntlet. Manya, please help me. Uh, do you remember? Butowski, Hull, Parkes, and Real. Yes, good. Okay. Um, and there's another one by, by Ortin and uh, Patrick Mason, which is also nice, which is very relevant. OK. Uh, okay I should hurry up a little bit. So what is the idea? So, so form the following bilinear. So assume that there is some solution. Okay. So what we know, so assume that there is a, a supersymmetric solution. And the idea is that I'm going to use the BPS equation to find properties of the solution. And if I find enough properties of the solution, I'm going to reconstruct it. Okay. So form this thing that's a scalar. Okay, so that's a bosonic thing. Form that's F1. Huh? No, no, no. Psi, psi. Just a second, I'll, I'll, I'll explain this in a second. So firstly, I'm assuming that now I'm using some Dirac notation. It's just psi. So what I'm, what I'm going to do is form bilinears of the gravitino, various bi bilinears. Okay. And ah, sorry. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right. So sorry, I meant, I meant it's okay. Yeah, so it's the gravitino. Yeah, sorry, sorry. You're absolutely right. I don't know why I said that. So epsilon. Well, just, just give me a second because I think I've written it out in the language of psi. Yeah. Huh? Sorry? Uh, again, Manya can help maybe. So you just want to combine the epsilon i and j into the Dirac spinner. That's right. And that's. Sorry, sorry? So, so you shift to Dirac spinner. Yeah, there's an epsilon. Yeah. 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 Now, the question is whether these bilinears are made of psi or epsilon. Uh, yeah. yeah, that's how we made it. Uh, so, uh, yeah, whether, yeah, okay, so let me call it psi. Okay, thank you very much. Let, let me just call it psi. It's a, it's just a direct 
yeah, it's some, yeah, so epsilon, maybe, okay, okay. So, so this psi when it comes is epsilon, yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's, not, it's not the same as that, it's not the same as that. It's not, it's not this. Okay, so I, let me just continue calling it psi because I did that in my notes and maybe even in the paper, that's why, okay. Okay, so, so uh, the point is this. If I have some killing spinner, okay, then I'm gonna make bilinear sort of it. Let me make another one and it'll be very clear. T make this one. Okay. okay, so see if this is a killing spinner, this is a vector and it turns out that this is a killing vector. Okay, it's a bilinear on the killing spinner, it's a killing vector. And so, so this is some, yeah. Okay, so let me continue. So that's a scalar, that's a pseudo scalar. That's a vector. Yeah, so thanks for the clarification. Sorry, so psi is not equal to psi. Okay. Um, there's an I, of course. Okay, so then, uh, and from F1 and F2, I'm gonna make R e to the I theta. That's just we are arranging it. All right, and now, also, r and theta are not related to anything else. So this killing spinner equation one, if you apply this to this bilinear, you get the following. That tell me of x, let me call this x, is 1 fourth t mu nu minus k nu, and t mu nu x bar is 1 fourth t mu nu plus k nu, okay? So you just, what you're doing is you know that this should be equal to zero, okay? So you multiply this by epsilon bar or psi bar, and then you get some equations, all right? And another equation you get is d mu k nu, it's minus one eighth t mu nu plus <coughs> x minus one eighth t mu nu minus x bar, okay? So, so sorry, sorry for this confusion. I hope it's clear, right? You just, yeah. So, CFC bar are the No, 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 so, okay, sorry, maybe I should have stuck to Leo's notation. This is just epsilon. So, psi is not the, sorry about that, yeah. That's right, that's right, but yeah. Okay, now, so this side, uh, this side is manifestly anti-symmetric. Okay, and therefore, if I symmetrize this, I get zero. So that means that k is a killing vector. Okay? So that's the kind of thing you get. So if you assume there's a killing spinner, it means that there's a killing vector in the geometry. I still haven't told you what the geometry is. But if the geometry supports a killing spinner, it must also support a killing vector. Okay? Then, uh, <coughs> then you use some fierce identity. You get that k mu, k mu is r square. Okay, so it's all just algebra and using this one equation and sp spinorial algebra. Um, so, sorry, minus r square. So that means that the norm of this, so k mu that means is either time-like or if r square is zero, it's light-like. The two cases, so assume it's time-like, so k, then you can call just ddt. You can give, it means that the geometry must have a coordinate, which I can call t, which is time-like. Okay, there's a time-like foliation. Okay, so you get some information here. Then similarly, there are one forms called, let me call them phi a, phi alpha, alpha is one, two, three, uh, which are closed. Okay, so similar analysis will give you that. So that means that at least locally, you can write phi alpha as dy alpha. All right. Okay, so then you can check that k mu, so phi alpha is phi alpha mu is mu. You can check that this is zero, k mu phi alpha mu is zero and phi alpha mu, phi 
beta mu is r square times delta alpha beta. Okay, so you get all these kind of properties of the one form. So what this means is that there are three sort of coordinates y, which are so so time foliates the manifold, and then there are three coordinates y inside the the spatial slice, um, which look like that. So you, you start to form a metric. So this means that the metric must look like that. It must look like minus r square dt plus some one form v square plus one over r square times dy alpha dy alpha alpha equal one to three. Okay, so you start getting a metric. Okay, just by these properties. All right, and then there's a long story. You keep going like this, which I'm not going to tell you. So the main uh, things I'm going to use, uh, like here, are the BPS equations, um, smoothness. So that's for Francesco, and uh, the boundary conditions, which is ADS two times S two. Okay. And a lot of patience and good collaborators who don't make mistakes with notation. Uh, and so with these three conditions, um, it turns out that you actually can completely uh, nail down the problem in this case, almost completely. So what you get is d s square is e to the phi of x times r square minus 1. I'm writing the Euclidean theory directly, although I started in some Lorentzian theory. OK, so you get something pretty amazing. You get that essentially up to a conformal factor, is a conformal factor, uh, you get ADS2 times S2. So this conformal factor must be something like this. So, so if you think of this as ADS2, Okay, the metric overall can fluctuate. That's square root of g. Okay, and these are the only. There's just a one function worth per, uh, parameter, uh, one function worth of solutions. Okay, so it's quite it's quite a strong statement. Um, and then, in fact, remember that there was a dilatation gauge, uh, which we still haven't set, and we, we can use that to set this to 1. That just makes life easy. And in that case, you just get ADS 2 times S2. OK? Attract. Okay. So this means that, that you're actually integrating over the metrics, but in this case, you don't have to. You can, the only solution, you don't have to in the sense that the only solution that matters is the classical solution. OK? Yeah. You also have information about both having to have the same radius. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is really the attractor geometry. You get exactly this in, in this case. Because the boundary condition, essentially the boundary conditions in this case and smoothness in the Euclidean problem is very constraining. Because the first order equation, so, and, so, and this, you want no singularity, that's the thing which makes it very constraining. OK, then you do the same thing for um, the Gagino. So rather, all the Gagini. So this is equal to 0. Um, and again, I'm not going to write too much. So this is d slash of xi times epsilon plus yi ij epsilon j plus gamma mu f mu nu i epsilon ij epsilon j equal to 0. Okay? So given this, this has some killing spinner epsilon. Okay? So you use that to solve the vector multiplet equations. Um, and of course, one solution is the attractor equation itself, where yij, attractor solution, where yij is 0, that's the auxiliary field. x becomes x star, and f mu nu becomes f mu nu star. Remember, the attractor near horizon geometry was already BPS. Um, it turns out that all the solutions, the whole solutions, all solutions are the following. So a mu actually doesn't change at all from the attractor geometry. Star means attractor, like yesterday. Xi is Xi star plus Ci over R, where Ci is an arbitrary real number. Okay. Remember here, R goes from 1 to infinity. 
okay. So that goes off shell, the on shell value is x star, that goes off shell in the sense it does not solve the equation of motion, but it does solve the supersymmetry equation because it is supported by y i j, y uh, 1 2 is minus is plus 2 c i over r square, all right. So all the solutions are as follows. Okay, this took a little more time than I wanted, but that's okay. So all solutions, the whole solution manifold, so m log is g mu nu is just the attractor geometry g mu nu star. And for each xi, I have some excitation of this type. Okay. Now that thing is the real part of xi. Okay. Near infinity, everyone gets their attractor values as they should. And there's one parameter family. That parameter can be just labeled by the, the height at the origin, which is r equal to 1, which is just ci. Okay. So ci plus xi star, excuse me. So that, that thing is just, um, I'll call it phi i, um, which is ci plus x i star. Okay, so it's a one real parameter. So for each vector multiplet, there's one real parameter. Okay, so it's an enormous reduction. You started with an infinite dimensional manifold, you reduced to an nv plus one dimensional manifold. Okay, so this is for each vector multiplet zero to nv. Okay, so m log is just equal to phi i i equal to zero to n v. So that concludes the first thing, namely how to actually uh, calculate the localization manifold. Okay, uh, let me not pause for questions here because I'm running out of time a little bit, but we can do it after the lecture, unless they're very urgent questions. Okay, so then let me move on to the action. Okay, so the next uh, point is the action. And again, there are many issues uh, <coughs> which are different compared to the quantum field theory, one of which was already discussed. Um, and I'll come to this again. So you have S bulk of phi. You want to compute this on the localization manifold. Okay, that turns out, so it's equal to the Lagrangian of n equal to two <coughs> supergravity that I showed you on the localization manifold. So this is a f relatively simple step. I've given you the solutions, I've given you the Lagrangian, you just have to go and evaluate. Okay, so it turns out that the answer is very pretty. So evaluate. What you get is that this bulk Lagrangian, phi log, I, let me just, from now, just let me call it phi i. Phi i, that's, this is phi i. Okay, that's the localization coordinate. And it turns out that has a very simple form. 2i times, it's actually a total derivative, r, ddr of r times f of xi minus f bar of xi. Okay, so that's an exercise which you can do. You write this big Lagrangian that I showed you. And there was one term which was just f, the, the n times t squared or something. That turns out to be the only one that essentially contributes. So that means that the, sorry, was there, I heard some mumbling. Is there a question? That means that s bulk um, equals 8 pi squared. You do the integrals of the four dimensions. Integral from 1 to r naught dr. And that's minus 2 pi r naught imaginary of f at x star plus ci over r naught. That's the boundary term. Oops, L. Okay, so there are two terms. Bound this is a total derivative. Okay. So the action just gets the value of, of this at infinity, which is r naught, minus the value at 1. So that's the value at infinity plus 2 pi imaginary f of phi i plus i 
pi. Okay, because at r not equal to one, um, x just becomes phi. Okay, oh, sorry, at r equal to one, x becomes phi. R equal to r not, it's equal to that. All right. So now to this you have to add. So that's that's all. So the bulk Lagrangian bulk action is very pretty. It's just a sum of two pieces, and now you begin to see things fall into place. Um, this term is divergent. Okay. There's an R naught here, and this is going to be cancelled. But let me spend two minutes on that. Um, this is X star plus uh, something over R naught. So in fact, when you expand this at large R naught, you'll have two pieces. One is just F of X star. That's completely divergent and will be renormalized away. But there's a finite piece coming from the first derivative of this. The first derivative of F is called Fi. So what you're left with um, is, let me write here, is minus two pi r naught m f of x star minus m f of x f i, the first derivative, times this, which is c i, and the r naught will cancel, plus two pi m f uh, of phi. Okay, so that's the divergent part, and those two are the finite pieces. All right? Very good. Then remember, you have to add this thing, and this you can just evaluate. It's just two pi. It's the Wilson line, two pi qi e i star times r naught minus one. Right? Remember, the gauge field went as r naught minus one. Um, and now you want to add, so there's also a divergent piece here, and there was um, a finite piece here. And remember that real part of xi star is just ei star. I mean, okay, so that's what, that's in the attractor geometry. Uh, and also here, this imaginary f, uh, there's an imaginary f, fi at xi star. So that's just the attractor. So xi star means attractor. So you're asking, what is the imaginary part of fi at the attractor point? And that was the attractor equation, which was just qi. That was the second attractor equation. Okay. So put all this together, you'll see that there's some divergent part and a finite part. And you have to add a s boundary, which is um, minus 2 pi r naught times qi times real part of xi star plus imaginary of f of xi star. Okay. And then you can check that this boundary term, you can easily check that it's finite, that I've been fairly careful with the constants, so you should be able to check it. But you can also kind of see that it's super symmetric um, because um, you see the bulk action already is supersymmetric by definition, right? So up to this boundary piece, okay? The boundary piece is being canceled, okay? There's only that thing remaining. So the thing that you have to check supersymmetry of is the Wilson line itself. So the Wilson line as written is not supersymmetric, okay? But this is the same fix as, as Diego made, uh, Maldacena made, um, maybe other, maybe Sujong, I don't know who did this first. Um, is that you just add essentially delta Suzy of a plus x is zero, right? This a varies one way, x varies the other way in the same multiplet. Okay, so that's what this thing is doing. Okay, so at the end of the day, what you get is s renormalized is minus pi q i pi i plus two pi imaginary f pi i. Plus IPI. Okay. So that's S renormalized. Let me box it. Well, I'll box it in a second. So that means that Z ADS2 is now integral product I equal to 0 to NV d phi I. So here, there might be another measure there, which I'm not talking about. 
explicitly times z1 loop oops, at phi i. Okay, so that's the main equation. So you've essentially solved the problem. You've reduced the problem to an n plus one dimensional, nv plus one dimensional integral. It's an ordinary integral now, okay? And s renormalized is given by this, okay? There's some z1 loop which I haven't done yet. This is discussion for tomorrow. Um, but what has happened is The CI and the EI, remember this was an EI, that becomes phi i. And there's an EI here, no? No, no. Sorry, what? Uh, on what? It, it, it does, so, sorry, why does or why it doesn't? No, no, it's the, this is S, you, you do an integral. Uh, Lagrangian doesn't, but this is the integral of the, it's an integral of the local counter term. It's the integrated action I'm talking about. Yeah. No, no, the induced metric will, it's just the length of the, of the boundary, that's all I'm saying. The, the Lagrangian is some local counter term that I'm adding. The, the length was just this, no? The length was that. Okay, so, so Z1 loop I'll talk about tomorrow, but notice um, what happens uh, already that the classical problem was also written like this, in terms of exactly this. The classical problem was written in terms of a function of this type. The entropy, which I talked about yesterday, was exactly of this type. It was the Lagrangian transform of the imaginary part of the peak potential at the attractor value. The quantum problem, this becomes an integral of that um, uh, on this phi i. But now, you know, this phi i, this was actually a guess made by, um, well, based on work by Bernard DeWitt and Cardoso and Mohopt and Capelli. Uh, Oguri, Strominj, and Wafa made such a guess. Um, and this is kind of a derivation of, of that formula. I want to say one more thing before stopping, which is, it, it won't take too much time, maybe two minutes, um, about the action, again. Okay, so so far we took, we stuck to a two derivative action. Okay, I just wrote down the action yesterday and I said, think of that action, okay. But as we know and as we already discussed, uh, so this discussion is 10, 10, 21, 50, and 1306, 3796. Um, so in string theory or something like that, or if you have seen examples, this pre-potential will look like this. Okay, there's a cubic divided by x0. If you've worked with this, you'll immediately recognize this. And you, that, that's the thing that gives you the two derivative action, this cubic potential, okay? But the fact is that the formalism actually allows for arbitrary higher derivative actions of this type. Okay. As long as you have um, a certain type of f. So yesterday I said f must be homogeneous of degree two, okay, like this one. But in fact, you can add um, by a formalism, a slight extension of the formalism, which I'm not going to talk about. You can add terms of this type. These are linear. This is homogeneous of degree zero. And the way the homogeneity is absorbed is by introducing another field here called W, um, which has uh, weight two, if I'm correct. Okay, I'm, I'm being a little bit schematic, so please forgive me if the details are not correct, or correct me if there are experts. Okay, um, so that has degree two, and that has to do with, actually, let me call it W square, yeah, W square. That has to do with four derivative terms in the action. So this one had to do with two derivative terms in the action. That's four derivative terms. And in fact, you can just put an infinite sequence. You can put whatever you want. So there's, there's something with six derivatives and there's an infinite sequence, okay? As long as the whole thing is homogeneous, um, it all works out. 
Okay, so the, the formalism of n equal to two, off shell formulation of n equal to two supergravity easily allows for inclusion of this kind of higher derivative terms. Okay, you just change f, and in fact, in string theory, these things have um, very uh, direct meaning. So this one is some intersection matrix of the Calabi-Yau. This one is some second Chern's class of the Calabi-Yau, and so on. Just some function. Okay. So the f terms, so f terms, uh, are of this type. So in superspace, it looks like some d4 theta times f of some superfield x. Okay, so this is in superspace. Okay, that, that's how this formalism is made. So as long as f has the correct properties, this is guaranteed to be supersymmetric. So all you have to do is to write down what f is. It's an infinite series. In string theory, this is given by some topological string and so on. Okay, so that's the holomorphic prepotential. Um, but the fact is that in Everything, my whole derivation, I only used of shell Q. Okay, I never used what, what the action actually was, although I said keep the two derivative thing in mind. The whole thing goes through with this F. It doesn't matter. Okay, so this equation still holds. Okay, so this is a way of taking into account a whole class of higher derivative terms. All right. And now, this is not the only type of terms you can add to the action. Like, you know, in supersymmetry, there are d-type terms. Let me go here. So there are d-terms which, so d-terms in superspace, so these are holomorphic functions of superspace. D-terms have this type of it's like the Kähler potential in n equal to one. Okay, so it's, it's, it's a non-holomorphic function, and something like this. It could you can have x i x i bar, for instance. Okay, it's a non-holomorphic function. That's an example. Okay, and there is no known classification of all possible d terms, but there's a large class of d terms that one has people have written down. So this is this paper by Dewitt and um, Katmanas, I think. Yeah. Um, and one can check, so that's what is done in this paper. That's the paper with Val. Um, so again, because of the localization, I never need to know what the action is. This, this formula holds. I just have to evaluate the renormalized action, whatever action is given to me. So I can just take this, take the same formula, and just evaluate this. Instead of the F term action, I can also add this. Okay? And uh, what you get is that S renormalized uh, of the D term just vanishes. Okay. So I'm essentially done. Um, so that means that this formula is actually really true. So it's so it started with all kinds of assumptions. So let me just tell you the the uh, sort of turn it around. So you start with some string compactification, if you want. So at low energies, it has some two derivative action given by an F term, which I wrote yesterday. Then at higher and higher energies, it has all kinds of corrections. So there's F term corrections, and there are D term correction. You include all that, and I want to do a path integral with all of that. Turns out that D terms actually don't matter. Okay? And the F terms do matter, and that's captured by this formula. So this formula is not some two derivative formula. It's a nonlinear formula. Okay? So that's, that's getting towards the exact entropy. Um, tomorrow, I'll finish this program. Tomorrow, I'll discuss what Z1 loop is. And maybe uh, if you ask me in the question session just now about the singular metric, then I will answer. All right, thank you very much. <laughs>